Wonderful. So welcome to uh, class number two of this course. Today we will embark on a little more philosophical uh, discussion on what it means to uh, practice and understand art. So what, what is art? How can we define art um, as a discipline from the perspective of visual communication? So I encourage students to open the PowerPoint slideshow number two and I'll do the same thing with you. So the first thing that I would like to discuss is historical overviews, themes and research within visual and performing arts. So what does it mean to define art? What are the purposes? Now the first image is an image from a painting, one of the most famous paintings in art history. It's the Gioconda or the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, an Italian painter, artist, inventor, engineer, uh, the very definition of Renaissance man. And the question here is, is this art? Uh, why or why not? What elements does it have or not have? Now, in a very basic definition of art, we could think of Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, and think of it as one practice that allows us to relate to the world. We could think uh, Aristotle had three types of knowledge um, to define modern day uh, conceptualization of science, and this three types of knowledge uh, included episteme, phronesis, and techne. So episteme, the study of what science actually is, phronesis as the prudence, you could say even the bioethical component of uh, making science, and finally techne, as the name implies, the technology uh, underlying science. Now within the technical part, this technical part, we could think of art as well. So art as the scientific discipline that contains skills that will allow us to represent the world as close as possible to reality. All right? But is art and technology, art and skills exactly the same thing? Well, looking at this painting, a person might actually think that um, just because the painting is so well painted, this in itself should be considered art. So if this is one of the questions, can we relate to this painting as a way to describe it as well-accomplished piece of work, well-accomplished piece of skillful representation of reality? Well, the answer, of course, will be a yes. In the next slide, we will focus on the objectives of this activity to see if limiting ourselves to skill-based art is a necessary outcome in the conversation. So in order to determine a definition of art, what it means to uh, relate to art, art history, art as practice, decide what is art and what is not art. So this will be the first part of art as art criticism, which is something that we will continue uh, as we progress through the semester. Define terms related to the viewing of art, so in other words, whether art and art quality is in the eye of the beholder or not and finally examine two or more images critically. Now, in the next image, again, we talk about um, an example of Renaissance art, or pre-Renaissance art with uh, Leonardo da Vinci. The second one is a work by Andy Warhol, a Polish-American pop artist, one of the uh, pop artists par excellence. Um, and the question here, again, is this art, is it true art, and what elements does it have or not have? Now, in terms of representation, we can see here how immediately recognizable this image is. Uh, we, after all, are all familiar with a Campbell condensed tomato soup can. And we can also see, however, that the quality itself, in terms of representation, the real data, is nowhere as good as in the example by Leonardo. Now, one of the core elements in pop art was this added multi-layer representation that wasn't really discarding the real fact. In fact, all pop art was supposed to be recognized and recognizable, but it's also simplified in its shapes, colors, and overall uh, presentation. Now, pop art is also popular art. In fact, pop really is a shortcut for popular. So the art of the people Pop art is also very specifically North American, especially United States, in a sense that it creates its own art system, art movement, 
as a separate entity from the rest of the world, especially separate from Europe, the geocultural area from which the vast majority of our production till that point um, originated, at least in the United States. So, pop art as a simplified, immediately recognizable, but also commercial, business-based type of art. Art as repetition, as we will see in the future when we will talk about Walter Benjamin. Other important factors. What type of media are we talking about here? Now, one of the essential differences between Andy Warhol and Leonardo da Vinci is, of course, the difference between acrylic paint as opposed to oil paint. Now, we will talk about the evolution of oil paint and tempera with a transition from um, the usage of uh, excellent preparation of paint as opposed to completely uh, artificial lab fabricated acrylic colors. Differences that are immediately perceived as uh, influencing the speed of representation, acrylic colors are famously known to dry very, very fast, as opposed to oil painting. You know, if you have a, a painting made completely with oil as a medium, as a technique, um, usually within the first six months you have a complete dry uh, painting at a touch level, but you have to wait up to 12, sometimes 18 months uh, before the painting itself is completely dried and ready to be um, uh, showcased in, a, in an art exhibition, for instance. The other difference is that um, oil painting forgives, so to speak, a lot of mistakes in a sense that because it takes longer to dry, the artist can always make you know, adjustment and little edit as the artist progresses um, in the work. Uh, acrylic instead, because it dries very, very fast, requires, if there is a mistake, to be um, repainted in the area that you want to change and edit. Now, other differences, of course, are due to the conceptual element of making art. We will talk about the concept many, many times in this semester, because there is more than just understanding art from the perspective of skills and the things we represent. We also want to investigate the symbolism, the message. Subject matter, what the artist is conveying. Now, art is also created with the purpose to be delivered, to be shared. And there are some artists, especially within the contemporary uh, art scene, that will disagree with these statements. Uh, some uh, may be heirs of the bohemian uh, kind of poetic uh, attitude will also say that art is done from the perspective of the artists themselves wanting to express something uh, almost in a detached way from the possible uh, judgment of the public. So I'm painting my painting because I like to paint because it means something to me. Um, there is a connection between this aspect and craftsmanship or the ability to make objects attractive. Now the more skilled an artist is, the easier it would be to create a piece of art that will attract the public. After all, even in an age in which we live in, an age of extreme development of technology, um, although, you know, we, we don't really know what's going to happen in 20, 50 years from now. Uh, an age in which, you know, technology allowed us to represent reality in an uh, unprecedented precision and a precedented way to uh, have our piece of art be almost exactly the same as the real data in comparison to the art in the past. Now, this ability to evolve removed to some extent the craftsmanship of the artist. In other words, we can no longer claim that it is only a matter of individual artists base skill whether a piece of art is as good, so to speak, as reality. Photography itself was a groundbreaking um, change in the visual art scene. In fact, for the first you know, uh, 10, 20 years of development of photography, photography was not really considered as an artistic type of discipline was mostly considered a technological uh, advancement. After all, what honor, what pride can an artist really receive if it is a machine that is representing fact instead of the hand and the eye of the painter. And then we have design, the grammar, the structure, the semantic of the visual image, the semiology, you could even say, what kind of um, uh, theme, what kind of symbol, what kind of message, what type of language the artist used 
to uh, describe the um, elements contained in the arts piece that they create. In another image, we talk about different type of pop art. Um, at the board with um, the, the great art scene, the art scene within the museum, and this cartoon, cartoonish element um, that came, you know, to the uh, attention of the great public, also thanks to uh, cinematic art. And we're talking about, in this case, uh, Spider-Man, um, an extra from Spider-Man. And again, what is the question here? If you think about the art by Roy Lichtenstein, for instance, Again, an even more simplified type of uh, um, phrase, movement, structure, um, brush stroke, and so on, even in comparison to Andy Warhol. So this simplified, immediately recognizable form of art that now becomes not just a symbol or symbolic type of representation, but becomes a logo. It becomes an immediately recognized uh, and recognizable uh, signature of art. If we want to uh, embark on that critique of art, however, there are a few things that at least we should keep in mind in our efforts to present a piece of art. Now, I also want to mention that there is a separation between um, art criticism as constructed by the art system itself and something that finds uh, its application in contemporary art museums, uh, in auctions, uh, in publications, and so on and so forth as opposed to the sheer analysis of an artwork. There, there is a bit of delay, you know, in, 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 there's a bit of separation also because art criticism always involves art critics. And just as art critics could examine the history of art, they will not be too different from what a historian does. Uh, and of course, this discipline is by definition biased, a bias that has to be informed, however, but the art criticism also adds something to the art piece to the extreme at times that the art critic, even the curator, this figure that curates the exhibition in public spaces or private exhibition, adds something to the art world that maybe the artists never envisioned themselves. Added meaning, added structure, added a new way of reading what the art piece uh, delivers to the public. Now, a few things to keep in mind here. Let's uh, move on to the next slide. Form and shape. First thing first, I like to talk about words all the time. So we could say that form and shape are pretty much the same thing uh, in two different languages, in two different uh, linguistic or language families, form from forma in Latin uh, and shape with English from the Germanic counterpart. Uh, another Germanic word you can find in, uh, uh, in modern German will be gestalt as well. So the structure, the, the shape, the form, something that is created, a form that becomes the container of a message as well, okay? So formic can be, as anagram, morph into morphic. Formic, morphic. So metamorphosis, for instance, will be uh, a good Greek counterpart to this uh, discussion. Motion and proportion. Now, this becomes more and more important as we evolve from the perspective of technology. Uh, motion especially, uh, you can imagine in, in a time where there was no cinematic art, there was no photography, one of the biggest questions that artists uh, were supposed to answer was how to represent something in motion when your only tool was a, a bidimensional piece of paper or, or, or a canvas, for instance. How you can represent motion? And we will see that uh, one of the greatest answers in uh, time closer to us was futurism in Italy during um, the early um, 1919 with uh, Marinetti and so on, futurism as a movement, a philosophical movement and artistic movement. Proportion, perspective. Again, if the main goal is to make something recognizable, you can imagine how uh, the distance from the viewer is as important in describing what's out there, appropriately speaking, but also uh, to allow the viewer to uh, pay more or less attention to certain details that will be closer or further away uh, from us. Um, proportion also plays a philosophical role. The, the example that comes to mind is the evolution from the more uh, archaic to the more classic um, cl classical antiquity within Greece, for instance, and all the way to the 17 and 1800 Europe, for instance, the proportion of the human 
uh, figure within themselves, but also in the context of a temple, for instance. Within themselves, how many heads will fit in the structure of the body length, for instance, seven or eight. Um, and within the system of a temple, for, for, for example, how the human proportion becomes the new uh, meter, the new measurement, the new uh, basis for the rest of the temple. So everything has to be proportionate to the human shape, form, structure and figure. Light and color. Now, classical example here, photography, so drawing with the light, we can add more or less emphasis on certain shapes if we want these shapes to symbolize something, if you want to capture the attention on these shapes, because we want the viewer to be able to navigate throughout the canvas and stop and rest their eyes, so to speak, on what is more symbolically uh, valid and meaningful to us. And of course, everything else includes line structure, you can talk with symbols, we can talk with shapes, and so on. Now, in the next few slides, um, I wanted to include um, some more recognizable um, paintings. Now, this is one uh, by uh, Peter Bruchel, the Elder, um, the peasant dance, a very uh, famous painter. I guess I want the student to reflect a little bit about this uh, painting and see if they can apply what we just said so far. So take a look at this painting and come back in a little bit and see what you noticed here. Now, as an advice, I could, uh, for instance, um, suggest you take a look at the motion, for instance, that you see any uh, lines drawn from the right-hand side of the painting toward the center and progressively in a cone shape movement toward the left-hand side of the painting. Look at the proportion of the uh, figures represented in this uh, piece of art and also look at the bright lights as opposed to the shadows to, uh, in the painting to see if there's anything that you can attach in terms of meaning and uh, form within the representation. Now the next one, uh, similar, it's uh, another painter. Um, we are still working within the uh, Northwestern Flemish Dutch Germanic component um, of uh, late medieval and pre-Renaissance art. This is from Jan van Eyck, Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride. This is probably one of the most uh, famous examples of reflection in art history. If you take a look at the center of the painting, you'll see a mirror that um, accurately represents the scene. And again, I want you to pay attention to the way um, the, um, uh, the, the shape is, uh, is represented as a V here, a V shape that uh, ends with the two hands of the, um, the coniugi, the coniugi general fini, the center of the painting. And you also have a symbolic representation of the chandelier on top of that, followed by this mirror and by this bright red uh, sofa couch that has a representation on the right side of the painting. Again, symbolizing um, fertility, maternity, uh, the feminine principle, um, and there are many, many other uh, features within the, this painting, like the, the, the little pet at the bottom of the painting. Um, many other suggestions. I, again, I would like students to uh, take a look at this piece of art and see if they can uh, interpret it. Uh, first of all, without any uh, suggestion from the uh, art scene, the art criticism, the official one, but just see what this painting uh, communicates to you, persons of art. All right, this is part two. What is the purpose of art? Uh, does this question make sense? Um, why does art have to have a purpose, so to speak? Uh, I want to stress how important it is to look at art from the perspective of a metalinguistic approach. So metalinguistic is something that goes beyond language, that goes beyond communication. This is a visual communication uh, class, so I want students to use art as a metaphor, as a tool to explore many other things that will be uh, useful in their academic career and beyond that. Now art is something that can be done, we saw before, 
with the purpose of representation of the real data. And therefore, you have to develop those skills to be able to represent reality appropriately. So in other words, you're not, as an artist, any different than a photographer that is asked to take a picture, for instance, of a, uh, of a wedding or of a birthday, simply to help the individuals present at that celebration to remember what happened. So you're, you're some of a visual journalist in that sense. And yet art is much more. Uh, why would someone in the 21st century decide to purchase a painting instead of a photograph, for instance, knowing that photograph is more accurate from the perspective of reality pixel representation in comparison to any painting? So what is the purpose of art? One of the purposes of art is also not having one or having one depending on what uh, the viewer and the artist wanted from the art piece. Uh, so something that it's done beyond a uh, utilitarian, utilitaristic even um, perspective. We don't do art because we want to achieve a certain goal. We want to be surprised by the outcome. I really want to stress that because I really encourage students and it's more a day and age in which, um, unfortunately, I should say, everything becomes very much capitalistic, uh, economically oriented, and so degrees are relevant uh, only if they focus on productivity. And of course, engineering, STEM disciplines are more spendable than art, for instance. But beyond what we can achieve every day, beyond uh, living in order to make money, we also want to make sure to leave room for something that can be equivalent as free self-expression. Art definitely plays a huge part in that. So one of the first element here is ritual. Okay? Art as ritual, there are many, many examples in, the, in this uh, slideshow. I only wanted to include some of the most famous ones within uh, the Three Sisters, uh, so Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. Um, so art as a ritualistic representation of the divine essence, we could say. Now, of course, it, for some of you that might be interested in uh, art history and anthropology, you also know that there are certain cultures uh, that create pieces of art and they destroy them, they get rid of them after the ritual is over because the purpose is the direct experience of the divine spark of the divine flame. So uh, putting some of those uh, artifacts in a museum is really an oxymoron from the perspective of that culture. There are other cultures that play a lot of emphasis in, on the uh, visual representation of the human figure, for instance. So, in that sense, there's a big, big difference between uh, both the Jewish and the Islamic representation of the divine essence, which is not figurative by definition, is uh, iconoclastic by definition, and um, are represented, in, especially within uh, Catholic and Orthodox tradition. Uh, within Catholicism, even more so, you have statues, you have paintings, uh, you have a variety of representation of the divine being and, and, and God and the apostles and and, and Jesus and so on, uh, within Orthodox Christianity, the icons, that they are both containers and um, channels to divine force. Now, the, the same divine element is present in calligraphy, um, especially, as you can see an example, in Islam, for instance, um, and in some of the geometric representation that are, in, to some extent, also borrowed by uh, ancient um, canonized tradition, and therefore flowed to, uh, through Judaism, Islam, and finally Christianity. Now, art can also be commemoration, so commemoration of uh, big events or family events. We already mentioned uh, birthdays and uh, weddings, but also commemorations of uh, great power, or it's a great uh, political, social power, and so on. Now, commemoration means also a um, future-oriented statement. In ancient times, especially within the Roman world, uh, there was a concept, the damnatio memoriae, or the damnation of memory, which was an attempt to completely destroy any type of memory and therefore commemoration of an individual so that the new political power uh, whatever this political power was, a general, an emperor usually, could completely destroy the history and the personal story, the person that came before him, maybe an adversary, a political opponent, a general, the opposite uh, army, and so on, uh, to destroy the ability 
of the future generation to know anything about them. Okay, so this damnation of memory. So it's one of the last piece of uh, power achievement in history. After all, all human beings are mortal, and therefore, what best way to fight back this sense of mortality, this finite sense of being human, than create something that will allow our sense of self to be perpetrated in future. And this applies to paintings, to monuments, to books. One example here is Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, um, and uh, his figure that, despite the fact that uh, it was a figure that on paper is attempted to destroy uh, traditionally monarchist uh, uh, elements of society within Europe, and in fact, you know, the, um, the, the outcome after uh, Napoleon's final defeat was this restoration um, of uh, reactionary uh, monarchist elements, but he, he, after all, behaved as an emperor, the emperor of the whole united under his uh, um, brute force uh, Europe. In this context, I also like to talk about propaganda. Now, propaganda as a term, um, we, could, we could say origin from many, many directions, but one of the most common ones is that the propaganda fide for the propagation of faith, which was uh, both a, um, um, a historical element as well as a department and office within, within the Catholic Church. But anyway, propaganda means really to propagate, to share, to uh, develop a system that will reverberate certain messages uh, throughout the population. And one of the best examples, of course, is political propaganda in this day and age. As you can see, uh, there are no major substantial differences between propaganda of different uh, cultures, countries, and um, political affiliations here. We can see uh, the National Socialist Party in Germany, uh, we can see um, American propaganda during World War II, uh, we can see the combination of uh, uh, workforce and the army. So the, the, the element of um, portraying your enemy, your opponent, in a very dark, uh, obscure, evil light, and yourself, your um, political and social counterpart as the savior is something that is very, very common. And, and you can see here how that works in terms of shape, in terms of uh, language, both figuratively speaking, what type of structure the art has and what words are used. Okay? Um, so there is this component of memory, remembering, recording the fact, propagating elements, but also beauty, art as beauty art as the ability to look at the world and see the beauty in things. Now, beauty can be a beauty um, agreed upon uh, a priori, so to speak, so before uh, the fact, before the realization of art, and this is connected to what we said earlier about, for instance, the proportion and perspective of the human form as a, a microcosmos, macrocosmos, divine representation of self, or divine sparkle in the human body and so on, but also beauty as a representation of a new form of interpreting the world. You can find beauty in a, in a um, wasteland, so to speak. You can find beauty in a very decadent, um, polluted environment. And I want to spend a few seconds here. Now, the term decadent within English language came to signify a very specific um, um, philosophical and poetic and artistic uh, milieu and, 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 and movement, but decadent really etymologically speaking means falling apart. So cadere, Latin means to fall, and Italian as well means to fall. So decadere means something that is progressively uh, doomed to disruption, to, to uh, never-ending fading away process, to uh, caducity, you could say, to uh, um, ultimate defeat. Okay? So, decadent by definition contains this sense of um, finite element to uh, human life. Something is meaningful because it has to have an end. All right? um, beauty is also perceived in different ways depending on the cultural context, however. And I would like to mention the Greek term kalos in that sense. Uh, it's a term you can find in calligraphy. Okay? So, calligraphy really means uh, good handwriting. All right? um, 
uh, and these colors, it, it's good portfolio perspective is aesthetically pleasant, uh, pleasant, but also good in terms of appropriate for the setting. Um, and, and this is something that has to do with uh, some archaic component of reality um, perception. So philosophically speaking, what was uh, pleasant, pleasing to the eye was also morally good and was also appropriate for that setting. Okay, so we have kalos in Greek, we have um, bellus in Latin, so from the bonus from the higher good okay um, so what was good was also beautiful so beautiful inside and outside okay um, and there's a lot of philosophical components here as well uh, as you can see in, in, in propaganda images um, the human eye tends to perceive something that is fairly pleasant also as morally or cognitively intellectually higher uh, part of it has to do with constructed um, behavioral conditioning components. We learn how to see something more beautiful than something else. And that plenty of sight, for instance, that uh, identify this this you know social brainwashing really element when when children were exposed to uh, uh, dolls with uh, fair skin as opposed to a darker skin. So this is definitely a, a socially constructed type of brainwashing. But on the other side uh, of the spectrum here, we also need to think of the human figure as a progressively representation, progressive representation of an inner proportion. So for instance, things that are symmetrical appear to be more appealing than things that are asymmetrical. But our eyes also like to be surprised. So for instance, in a painting, when everything is constructed according to, for instance, the rule of thirds, all right? And so it's very structured, very symmetrical. But then the eye also likes to be engaged in surprise. So uh, here and there, the artist might decide to uh, go against those rules, to change, to to alter it, the um, this uh, geometric perfection, this uh, symmetrical component, and that makes the painting or the artwork more uh, interesting. Now, art is also narrative. We, we do art to, uh, to create uh, a story, fundamentally. And, 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 and the story happens first in the mind and the heart of the painter, uh, but it's also a story that relies upon previously told stories. So uh, there, there are things that um, are part of the socially constructed, um, let me rephrase it, not say socially constructed, but socially understood uh, parameters so uh, we rely upon um, you know universal facial expression for instance and we will talk more about them when we will talk about our perception we will talk about the the war by uh, Paul Ackman for instance so uh, facial expressions and emotion we talk about uh, some level of differentiation between how we perceive a standardized shape as opposed to our personal experience um, I include here some images from um, uh, Edvard Munch, for instance, the stream, uh, Guernica by, by Picasso. And you can see here uh, th th this visceral, this, this guttural form of, of emotion uh, almost relate to a primordial sense of self. So you have society as um, this uh, constructive, constructivist even, and constricting element, moralizing element at times, and this inner need, this subconscious need of you know, Freudian psychoanalytic memory that wants to come to the surface with full force and full power. Now, in part three, we will discuss what are the main R themes and schemas or schemata. Now, a few examples here. Um, there are still lives, there are abstract form of art, um, and there, there are some common themes here. Now, first of all, keep in mind what we said about what is the purpose of art. Now, if art had to represent something with the purpose of what we said so far, so uh, memory, commemoration, uh, narrative, ritual, and so on, you can imagine how things that were connected to human endeavors are more relevant. So you want to um, represent an emperor, a politician, a warlord or a saint, for instance, in a particular way, or you want to portray all the things that these people create in their lives. So 
human architecture and, and, and mosques and, and churches and synagogues and so on um, because you want to focus on the human element here and yet among all of this you have still life so that the creation of a type of art is focused on something that's not anthropically intended it has nothing to do with uh, the human component you have plants you have flowers you have fruits um, and uh, I include a few examples here. The first one here is by uh, Paul Cezanne. Um, another example by Alpha Arturar. And um, I want to focus on these two artists for a second. So the, 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 the French uh, component of you know, the, the early 1900 here, uh, th this very uh, intimate and, and, and powerful representation of you could say decadent uh, type of uh, image, as opposed to the uh, German, German Hungarian, I would say. Uh, Drachdurer's family um, came from modern day um, uh, Hungary, and his name, Dürer, from, from the um, Grofening Aino, has been well documented. Um, in this context, we see this Nordic attention to details, an attention that we, we saw previously with Flemish, Dutch painters. Um, of Northwestern uh, Europe. Um, and, and as you can see here, there is a combination of the technique and the media chosen. So within Cezanne, if you go back, a standard oil painting, centered in terms of the media, not in terms of the brush strokes, which are very, very different from um, previous representation, and watercolor on paper uh, for Albrecht Dürer. Uh, we will talk more about Albert Dürer. I just want uh, students for now to remember that Albert Dürer, by definition, represents a transitory period in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance components. Now, keep in mind that the Middle Ages in central southern Europe, the old Roman Empire, so especially Italy, were pretty much already over, and, and the country, although it wasn't really a united country at that time, but the, the, the geo-cultural component was really moving on to the Renaissance. Renaissance as rebirth of the ancient pride of the Latin culture, the Roman, the Italic culture. Okay? Um, in Central Northern Europe, first of all, the, the Germanic component, this Gothic element, although it wasn't really Gothic per se, you could say uh, Gothic mixture with some um, pre-medieval uh, Byzantine component, even definitely Germanic, Carolingian component as well, uh, carry on much longer in the rest of Europe. And you can see that in the representation of uh, um, church buildings, for instance, with uh, Gothic and Neo-Gothic you know, shapes until this very uh, moment. You could say, just think about uh, the University of Vermont, it's kind of Neo-Gothic, uh, Germanic element as opposed to uh, Washington DC which by definition is much more Latin, Roman, Italian in their culture with, with white marble and um, a um, memory of the uh, Roman greatness. Now you have another example here um, I, mentioned, I mentioned Jackson Pollock here uh, one of the most famous uh, American painters here um, what type of art is this? Is, is it a contemporary art? Is it a conceptual art? Is it a non-objective art? You could say all of the above. Now, of course, it's contemporary, and, and the term contemporary uh, can be somewhat of a misnomer in a sense that contemporary is anything that happens while we're talking about it. So you could make the case that uh, Albert Dürer was a contemporary of his time, of course, the same for Leonardo da Vinci and the same for, you know, archaic Greece, for instance, okay? But generally speaking, uh, contemporary art defines something that comes after modern art. So usually 1900 and on is contemporary art, 1930, 1950s even more so contemporary art, um, although it's really hard to, de you know, to define what is modern and what is contemporary. Many museums uh, are defined as modern and contemporary art, or contemporary and modern art museums. Um, generally speaking, contemporary art, uh, by definition, represents 
either a conscious break with the past, so something goes against the past, and therefore something goes against beauty as universally intended, okay? So, so the focus is not so much on the, the aesthetic representation, but the focus is on the message, and that's why we talk about conceptual art, okay? Or it, it is um, an amelioration, or maybe a technological amelioration of um, classic art, and in, in this uh, uh, case we will think about um, hyper-realism within art, so that, that something that looks more real than reality, okay? But always keep in mind that this type of representation uh, were a pro of the 1950s and 60s, so uh, everything has been already uh, presented, so to speak, okay? So in other words, you can either um, go against the previous art uh, scene, or continue, elaborate upon that, um, uh, add something to it, what you cannot do is to pretend that the previous moment never existed. And I mention this because you, you'll see this in, in a variety of things. Now, uh, there, there are a few elements of uh, religious representation, statues, votive statues, and, and buildings, temples, and so on. Um, a huge difference between you know, the, two, the two sisters, the um, Eastern and Western Catholics, the, the Orthodox Church, as it's called nowadays, and, and, the, uh, and the Catholic Church. Um, and I, we should really you know, specify by Orthodox, we, we, we tend to, to identify the Greek, Romanian, Russian, Serbian, Moldovan tradition of the Church. And by um, Catholic Church, we identify the Roman rite within the Catholic Church. Now, of course, we do have Oriental Catholic Church in full communion with, with the Pope. But from the perspective of what I'm trying to say here, an Orthodox Church tend to look pretty much the same if it's built nowadays in 2020 as it was a thousand years ago. By definition, something about the same never changes versus within the Catholic counterpart. There is a sense of pride in uh, making sure that we don't create fakes, so to speak. Now, this is even more relevant within Europe, uh, and it's not, and it's not per se the same matter within the United States. So, for instance, um, creating a church that resembles a new, an old one in the United States is sometimes perceived as homage. Think about the. Uh, um, cathedral in, in Washington DC, which is a full re-representation. Re Again, think about, not in the context of a uh, religious building, but think about the uh, University of Vermont and, and uh, um, Natural uh, Museum of History, I think, is Natural Museum, uh, in, in London, which is a, it's a carbon copy, almost brick by brick copy. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a nonsense from a European perspective because it, it, it's perceived as a fake ancient artifacts, you're trying to portray something as old, whether it's really not. Um, and so, by definition, within the Catholic, the Roman Catholic world, a church built in 2020 should not look at something built, you know, during the first century. In the Orthodox counterpart, the closer the image uh, is, the better it is from the perspective of representation of this divine element. In any case, in both cases, there is full conscious um, understanding of the passing past, okay? So the fact that we are on, um, as human beings, we are part of a linear progression of time. Now, this is not necessarily true throughout the world. I really focus a lot on Europe. And um, there is uh, an element, um, here I, I, I uh, refer to the word by, uh, by Hokusai and by Xie Kui, um within the, Chinese as well, uh, we could say the, the, the Japanese counterpart is a chronic, not necessarily anachronistic, but a chronic suspended um, element, the suspension of time where the person looks at the landscape and this landscape is really nowhere in a linear sequence of time. Now this was also very common in the ancient world, this, this notion that time is linear, that uh, of course, 2020 happens after 2019, and 2019, of course, happens after the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages, of course, happened after the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire, of course, happened after the Roman Republic, and so on and so forth. In ancient times, this perception of a linear uh, sequence, a chronological sequence, was not a given. 
you have understanding of uh, an eternal return, for instance, something that uh, was uh, brought forth by uh, many, many philosophers. I think of Nietzsche, for instance, in, in relatively recent times. And also a Euroboros, this, 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 this uh, serpent, this snake that is shaped like a ring, that it's an ongoing process. And never in um, life something's created from scratch. It's a constant rebirth, regrowth, uh, and therefore re-representation of something that is universally valid, something that is eternal and uh, suspended from time. So the time of human beings, it's not the time of the gods, so to speak. Um, now, other elements here uh, are cityscapes. Um, this is a painting by Corot, uh, Jean-Baptiste Corot, The View of Venice, again, uh, late uh, 1800, 1834, so 19th century. Um, this is all of the above. Uh, this is a narrative, a narrative that focuses on the very moment in which the painting was uh, created, but also a narrative of commemoration and memory. Now think of this 1834. Now Venice was one of the uh, long-lasting uh, civilization in Europe, roughly between you know, the 8th century and the 1800s, so you know, uh, thousand years uh, of history, continuous history with the uh, Republic of Venice, the Serenissima, um, and also this sense of a temporary loss but never forgotten greatness here, okay? And we're talking about, of course, um, a lot of revolution here and Napoleon and, and post-enlightenment um, times here as well. Um, other uh, painting here by uh, Pedro Paul Rubens, Judgment of Paris. Um, again, the component of decadent, Flemish, uh, European, um, noble, traditional, and yet um, new creation is fully contained in this art. So there's a Renaissance element. And of course, it's a renaissance, a rebirth of something that's no longer present. So, of course, it's to some extent a caricature of the great element. Now, this, of course, refers to the ancient Greek tradition. And, and there is something to be said about the reinterpretation that the Central European power had of Greece. Now, it is almost as if a huge part of Greek culture, and by that I mean the Byzantine or Eastern Roman culture of Greece, uh, we, we, we shouldn't forget that the Roman Empire did not seize all at once when you know Rome fell to the quote-unquote barbarians, but it continued for you know, you know a thousand years you know in, in the eastern part. So this whole Byzantine element, the Roman culture of, of Greece, even more so the Roman Christian culture of Greece from Constantine on, continued to live. But in the eyes of the central powers in Europe, Greece was mostly connected to the. Uh, Greek or Greek or Roman pagan world, so the ancient deities of that time. And that's what we find here in the representation of the ancient Greek tradition. It's, Greece was really, uh, and still remains, the, the, the beating heart of Europe, of ancient Europe, but also due to the changes and incorporation of multiple cultures. Cultures were also, at that time, to be perceived by Western powers as against tradition. Think of the sect of Constantinople that did not involve just you know, the, the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantine uh, heirs against the Ottoman Turks, okay, themselves you know, heirs of the Celtic Turks, but also the East and West counterpart, you think about the Fourth Crusade and uh, um, the attack of the Crusaders on a certain political faction uh, of Constantinople to defend the other political faction, you think of um, the um, the sack of the city, but also of the you know enormous crimes perpetrated by all sides, um, and in the midst of this chaos, this longing for a time where gods were among men, men as in human beings, of course. Um, a uh, a reverence an honorific perception to a Greece that was not perceived just in modern times by European powers, 
but already by the Romans, you know, the, the, the whole uh, story history of the foundation of Rome is related to the, uh, this ancient primordial Indo-European Greek counterpart, if you think about the Enes and the, and the story of, uh, of Troy, those things are deeply connected in, um, in uh, first of all, in, in an attempt to prove uh, to posterity the continuation of tradition, and this is not different from what happened 2,000 years later um, with the Salic law in Europe, with the monarchy that wanted to provide evidence of uh, a certain bloodline of ancestry, something that, by the way, was almost a nonsense in, in Roman time, and, and including Constantinople, in other words. It was not automatic that the power was uh, to be shared through family lines from father to son. It was not uh, expected, although it happened quite often. Now, within this discussion of um, common greatness and, and, and prestige and privilege uh, by uh, considering oneself the heir of the ancient ones, uh, something that, by the way, that the Ottomans did toward the Romans, they considered themselves the, the heirs of the Roman Empire. After all, the Roman Empire changed religion once, moving from, you know, Greek or Roman paganism to Christianity. In their mind, it couldn't change once again from Christianity, Orthodox Christianity to, uh, to Sunni Islam. Now, within this cultural framework, an example here, the Discus Thrower, which is a Roman marble copy uh, of a, a Greek bronze, follows the same um, attitude, the same mentality. The greatness of beauty predicted upon perfection. So, and, and human form was divine perfection. So again, all this talk about proportion and perspective really uh, fully represented here. All right, to, to conclude a few more things, uh, I want to talk about portraits. I want to talk about the social component of making art. So what type of genre, what kind of commentary, what kind of historical subjects we have here, um, and self-portraits. I really encourage the students to take a look at uh, this representation. Um, as you can see, there is a, a combination of self-portrait as a way to memorize um, the combination between the actor painter, so the the actual viewer embodied by the same person, the artist, but also to make political reforms and, and political activism visible, tangible through a piece of art, where reality becomes more real than what it is. Again, also keep in mind that um, there is a shift in perception between the lens of interpretation of the artist, politically involved artist, as opposed to the viewer that might not have been present, but uh, during you know the the um, historical facts described by the artist, by 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 viewing the piece of art, is as if the viewer was indeed present, and so there is this constant re-representation and uh, life creating component in making art. Now among the last one, um, within expressionism and um, and um, abstraction, you can think of these two opposite poles, these opposite forces, expressionism as this need really to express oneself uh, more beyond reality, something like against reality, against the social constricting norms of society, this moralized norm of society, and abstract, which is to some extent, simplification, simplifying the object, but simplifying as a way to recreate a new essence, okay? A concept that you will see is very, very important when we will talk about certain philosophy in arts, and in this context, I think about existentialism, French existentialism. You can think of uh, um, Sartre and Camus, uh, but also, you know, eventually this, um, post-modernist philosophy, and I'm thinking of, of, of um, Derrida, for instance, where existence trumps essence, right? So uh, the fact that we are alive is more important, I'm kind of or simplifying things here, than what we are actually are, because it, that doesn't really exist in self. So in other words, we as human beings are creators and therefore responsible of our destiny we are what we become. So our existence, existence 
in the here and now, in, in this world, in this moment, in this historical moment as well, it really matters. It matters because in more extreme cases of, of um, um, existential philosophy, there's nothing universally valid we should embrace but what we create with the tools given to us at the time. So I'd like to conclude here um, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, um, receive some of your emails if you have any questions, uh, feedback or any comments to make in regard to the topics discussed today. Thank you very much.